all of us are supposed to learn all of these 11 areas. Because you put those 11 areas together and it gives you a picture of Jesus. When you look at all of the different 11 permanent gifts, what you're looking at is Jesus. And you're called upon to become more and more like Jesus. Well, we begin uh, tonight, part two, in what is my spiritual gift? What is my spiritual gift? Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. And I believe that most Christians have more than one. Um, many Christians have three spiritual gifts, some four. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, would you read that, those two verses out loud with me, please? But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. These two verses teach us that the Lord Jesus has given gifts, spiritual gifts. We know they're spiritual gifts because in verse 7, it talks about grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And so every believer has a minimum of one spiritual gift, but trust me, you probably have more. Now, we have spent weeks going through the different gifts that the New Testament talks of. And we realized that there were certain gifts that were used in the New Testament time, the first century, uh, when the church got established and when the Bible was completely written by 95 AD. There was no longer any need for some of those gifts. They were temporary. Then there were gifts that were permanent. The 11 permanent gifts were ministry, exhortation, giving, ruling, mercy, teaching, helps, government, faith, evangelism, and pastor. Now, a couple of Wednesdays ago, um, because we had a little break in there, we examined the spiritual gifts of pastor and teacher. Those are available to be rewatched if you, if you missed them. Uh, they're online. Uh, go to our website and you'll be able to find them there. Tonight, we're going to examine two more spiritual gifts, the gifts of ministry and the gift of faith. Ministry and faith. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer now. Our loving Father, help us tonight to uh, have our eyes opened as to what these gifts are. And all the while we're learning, please uh, encourage us and maybe uh, prod us a little to try to do a self-examination if perhaps some of us here tonight have the, the gifts of, of ministry and or faith. Lord, glorify yourself. Help us as we do this study. We pray that everyone's faith would grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, the gift of ministry. For this, we're going to turn back to the book of Romans, chapter 12. So turn there with me now, please. Romans, chapter number 12. Remember, there's three chapters in the New Testament that deal specifically with uh, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are actually touched on uh, a wee bit in a few of the other New Testament books, but just made mention only. In these three chapters of Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4, we have the fuller and more in-depth explanation. So here we are in Romans chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse number 7, and the words are simply this, or ministry... Let us wait on our ministering. And so this is the gift of ministry. Now, what is the spiritual gift of ministry? The New Testament, as you probably know, was written in the Greek language. And the Greek word here, translated ministry, is the word diakonos. Diakonos. And it means service. That's what it means. Uh, as in waiting upon someone, serving them, like a table waiter. In fact, uh, on that note, if you turn back to Acts chapter number 6, we can see this very clearly. Acts chapter number 6. 
And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So there was a daily ministry going on, a food ministry. And verse number 2 is what I want you to see. Then the twelve, those are the apostles, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and the akinos and serve tables. The same Greek word used right there. And so here's the problem. The problem was that uh, they needed some men. In that early church, in those early days, they needed to find some men who could take over the regular, specific, ongoing food ministry to the widows, the Hebrew widows and the, the Grecian widows there in the church. And so they found, they chose and ordained seven men to do this regular ongoing ministry. Now from the word viakonos, we also get the English word deacon. It was sort of transliterated from one language to another, borrowed if you will. Now a deacon is a man that is actively involved in a regular ministry in his local church. Now technically, any Christian man in a church doing a regular ministry is something like a deacon. But, however, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the term deacon later came to refer to one of the two ordained offices, the elected offices, official elected offices in the church, pastor and deacon. Those are the two. So how does this apply when it comes to the spiritual gifts used in a local church? For example, this local church. Well, we learn something basic, and that is this. The word ministry, the spiritual gift of ministry, refers to a specific, ongoing, regular job that needs to be done in the church. It's not a one-off. It's a regular, ongoing, specific kind of work that needs to be done. It definitely involves serving others. It's very much like how a table waiter will serve other people. Now, examples of this within a local church uh, might include usher. We need ushers, don't we? Every service, we need ushers. That's an ongoing, specific, regular ministry. Nursery workers. Well, if there's no babies for the nursery, then I guess they got the day off. But usually, we have little ones that need tending to. And nursery is absolutely a ministry. It's an ongoing, specific, regular ministry. Um, greeter. Always we have need of greeters uh, to welcome people in. And the Lord has been blessing our church with uh, a good number of visitors. We always seem to be getting visitors. Praise the Lord. That's a good sign. Good healthy sign. A good growing church. A good church, I think, ought to be a growing church. Don't you? And if the church is going to be a growing church, then the people in the church need to be friendly. When visitors come in, we need to show ourselves friendly. By the way, that's a bit of a ministry too. But specifically, we need the uh, workers who will stand at the front door and uh, look good and sound good and welcome people and give them a bulletin and you know greet them as they come in. That's a ministry. You see? Um, other... Uh, jobs, other ministries in the church would include things like uh, the musicians who supply us with the music. The choir, there's a ministry. You see, these are all regular, ongoing, and specific jobs that need to be done in the local church. Now, um, take for example the job of a teacher. We know that uh, teaching is a spiritual gift. We've learned that. Now, if a teacher only teaches occasionally two or three times a year or something like that, that may not be a ministry. That's like a little spare, a fill-in. But if that teacher is teaching on a regular basis, and I like to think of regular as weekly. Things need to be done. There are some things that need to be done regular, right? In our lives, every day we get up regularly, we uh, brush our teeth or comb our hair, wash our face. Maybe have breakfast. We get ourselves dressed up regularly. Maybe we've got appointments. We've got to go to a place of work that we have to attend. These are all regular things. And on a regular basis, of course, we all need to be in the house of the Lord. 
By the way, I just want to remind everyone here and everyone watching online, to maintain your uh, membership in good standing at Grace Baptist Church, you need to attend at least once a month. You have to come at least once a month. Now, we made exception, of course, for COVID. Two years of COVID just washed all over the place, right? And we were like a, a ship in the middle of the uh, Mediterranean when Eurachlodon, that uh, crazy storm, whipped up and were tossed from one side to the next. All right, but that's behind us now. We're getting back to normal. We've got no restrictions upon us as a church. Hallelujah. Boy, I've been, you too, huh? we've been waiting a long time for this. We're getting back to normal. So COVID's behind us. So just a little reminder that uh, when you signed on to be a member, if you're a member of the church, that uh, one of the requirements is that you put in an attendance at least once a month. But I'd like to suggest to you it's better to come every week. It's far better. You'll get out of something what you put into it. If you're working shift work and your shift keeps you away, you know, for a couple of Sundays, whatever, that's understandable. But don't let, you know, the golf course keep you away. Don't let the beach, don't let relatives... Oh, they come over to visit on a Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Oh, well, bring them to church with you. Oh, then they won't come. Maybe that's better. <laughs> you have to decide that. But ministry is a regular thing. Now, teaching uh, is a spiritual gift that can become a ministry if we're teaching on a regular basis. So teaching is a spiritual gift, but you don't have to have the spiritual gift of a teacher in order to have a ministry. This is the exciting thing. Ministry often, more often than not, makes use of our natural talents. Weeks ago, I made mention that spiritual gifts are not natural talents. There's a difference between them. But, ministry is a spiritual gift that will make use of natural talents. And, We've got all kinds of talent in the church. Men and women both who can do amazing things. And so use those. Use those natural talents and serve the Lord. That's what this gift of ministry is all about. And try and do it on a regular basis. Just today I was thinking over this message and what came to mind was we often have a need in our church on a regular basis that doesn't really seem to get met. And there may be a couple of reasons for that. One reason is that not everyone knows about this. The other reason is that those who know may not want to do it. But we need washroom attendants. Uh, men and women who can go in and make sure the washrooms are sparkly clean and you know, the, the, the fixtures are shined up and the taps and the mirrors and so on. The place smells nice. That's a ministry. I remember many years ago reading about a, a church that had a, a, a wealthy couple in it. And this couple was well-to-do, husband and wife. And after church, they uh, put on rubber gloves and so on. And they, they went into the washrooms and started doing the, the work there. And the one who wrote about this story was a visiting evangelist. And the evangelist not noticed this and asked them, just wondering here, but you look kind of well-to-do, and here you've got this job of, of cleaning up the washrooms. Why is that? And they said, preacher, they said, we know that God has blessed us, and we know the devil has tempted us, to think of ourselves more than more highly than we ought to think. And so we have purposely chosen this ministry to help keep us humble before the Lord. And I read that and I, I was blown away. I thought that's, that's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. Because that shows a good uh, mental attitude towards spiritual things. Knowing that there's a devil in a spiritual warfare and hey, this is a great way to offset what the devil is trying to do. You see, God uh, loves it when we walk humbly with Him. When we humbly walk with our God, that's when God is excited. And so there's an example of a, a couple whom God had blessed materially, and they were well-to-do, and they purposely chose this 
ministry that others would not choose. And so there's just a a little heads up. I don't know if anyone here or watching online might think that there's a ministry for them. But on a regular Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday basis, we need those washrooms to look good. Particularly since we have visitors coming. We get used to the dirt. We do. This is typical with churches around the world. Something is broken and people notice it at first, then they don't notice it anymore. And they walk into the church and they don't even see that it's broken. They don't even see the, grass, the, the glass is cracked or the grass needs to be cut. They don't see the dirt in the corners. But I'll tell you who sees it. The visitors. That's the first thing the visitors will see. Are the things out of place. And so it's a ministry. An ongoing regular ministry. To uh, be temple keepers. you know, To make sure that the church is looking good and straightened up. Uh, you know, when you come in on, um, on a Sunday and you sit down, have you ever noticed how that the hymn books and the Bibles are all perfectly arranged and the little hardback writing board is always sitting behind the Bible? Uh, then, of course, there's the envelopes and the little pieces of literature and the pencils and, and things. How does that just happen? It doesn't just happen. There are people with ministries that make it happen. Okay, And so this is the whole idea of ministry, the spiritual gift of ministry. Now how do you know if you have the spiritual gift of ministry? Well, here's a couple suggestions. Number one, you will have a desire and a joy to start serving the Lord with whatever you can do on a regular basis. You'll have a desire and a joy. As we previously mentioned to you, along with spiritual gifts come the desire to use them. I remind you of Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Notice those words, to will and to do. Boy, you're willing and you're itching to get at it. So there's some joy, there's some enthusiasm, there's a little bit of excitement there to be able to do whatever you can do to be able to serve the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to uh, have a purpose. You know, that your life isn't not just a bump on a log or a, a potato on a couch uh, or something like that, but you have a purpose, a job to do. That's very important. So this is one important way in which you'll know if you have the, the gift of ministry is because you're looking for something to do. Um, well, we need to move on. Uh, The first is the gift of ministry. The second we're going to talk about tonight is the gift of faith. The gift of faith. And for this, we're going to turn to the right to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 12. So, let's see, where are you, 1 Corinthians? Chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 9. Notice it says, To another faith by the same Spirit. This is in the, the context of verses 7 down to verse uh, 10. And there's nine spiritual gifts listed here. There's permanent and temporary gifts listed here. But this one in uh, verse number 9, the gift of faith. This is a spiritual gift. What is the gift of faith. Well, it's obviously not some kind of human thing. You see, um, we're called upon to walk by faith, not by sight. And the old flesh doesn't understand faith. It understands sight, but it doesn't understand faith. Hmm? My little dog, Charlie, I hold up a treat and I say to Charlie, now Charlie, you can have this one treat now or... If you wait, I'll give you two treats. Charlie doesn't understand faith. (laughs) He understands what's right in front of his nose. That's the flesh. We understand what's right in front of us, what we can see. Faith is something else. It's something spiritual, intangible. You can't touch it. You can't see it. And yet we're called upon to live that way. 
So this is a spiritual thing. So we're saying that it's, it's obviously not a human talent. Faith is not where you stand in front of a mirror. Every day you convince yourself, why you handsome looking lucky dog? Today is going to be better than ever, isn't it? And you pump yourself up. That's not faith. I don't know what to call that, but it's certainly not faith. Faith literally means trust. And you have to trust something. Right now, you're sitting in one of the church pews. You are trusting that church pew to support your weight. If all of a sudden you heard a crack noise and you, you started to sink a little bit, I guarantee you'd jump out of that. You would instantly lose your trust, your faith in that pew. Faith needs an object. So you can't just have faith. Sir, do you have faith? Oh, I'm a man of faith. Oh, I have faith. Ho, 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 ho. I tell you, mm, faith, that's my middle name. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah, I'm a man of faith. Well, what do you have your faith in? Oh, do you really need something to have faith in? Yes, you do. Otherwise, it's not faith. Faith needs a resting place. Faith has to settle somewhere, sit or stand on something. Faith is not something we can work up by ourselves. It's something given to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us faith. Now all Christians, every saved man, woman, young person has faith. They have some measure of faith anyhow, but it seems that some Christians have this extra measure of faith. You have this Christian and that Christian and this Christian. And then you got this Christian with extra amount of faith. Now, how did that come to be? The Holy Spirit gave it to them. Remember, look at verse number 9. To another faith by the same Spirit. Now, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, Stephen was a New Testament deacon. And that man had the gift of faith. He had extra faith. In chapter 6, verse 8 of Acts, it says, Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. I believe that Christians with the gift of faith will be the ones who want to see great things happen for God. They've got faith. Faith in the power of God, faith in the Word of God, faith in God Himself. They want to see great things happen for the Lord. And God has given them that measure of faith. They'll tend to be more committed to Bible reading and prayer, because they know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So they're more committed to reading the Bible. They're more committed to prayer because they can actually feel their faith grow. Wow. Read the Bible, pray every day, and you'll what? Grow, grow, grow. And people of faith know it. Now, some of you go to a gym. And uh, you go to a gym and you love it. Some people go to a gym and they visit. I'm more of a visitor. I once owned a gym membership and I went, think twice. Yeah, well, don't laugh because there's a lot of me out there. A lot of people buy gym memberships and they go once, twice, and then they take a break and they never get back to it. And the gyms... Why is it? How can they stay in business and they only have a few people at any time in there? Why is that? It's because everyone else bought memberships and gave up. And yet they paid for the whole year. It's a great business to be in, I'll tell you. But people who go to a gym on a regular basis, they love it. Because they, they are doing the exercises on the machines and pumping and iron. And they look in the mirror and they can see the difference. And they stand up, and day by day, they feel better. They feel stronger. Runners also love it. There's something about running that runners love. I'm not a runner, okay? Except maybe I'll chase my wife around the dining room table a few times, and then I, I'm so puffing, you know, she has to wait for me. <laughs> and she's a patient waiter. So people who run, who like to go out and run a mile, two miles, whatever, they love it. There's some kind of, uh, what do they call that? The chemical endorphin or something like that. There's some chemical that they say gets squirted into the brain and gives you this feeling of, of, of feeling great. I've never experienced it myself. <laughs> but uh, people who run on a regular basis, they seem to love it. 
Uh, anyhow, people who have faith love reading the Bible and they love praying. You don't have to coax them. You don't have to encourage them. You don't have to beg and plead with them. Read your Bible. Pray every day. No. <laughs> it's like saying to Charlie, here's the kibble, fella. You don't have to tell Charlie twice. Sometimes Charlie's a little scared of his own dog dish, right? You know that. He's a funny little guy. He needs his mom or dad to stand by him, and then he's so brave he can eat up all that kibble. He loves his kibble. People with faith, they love the Bible. This is one way to know, I suppose, if you have, if you have this wonderful gift of faith. Now, missionaries. Missionaries usually have all been given the gift of faith to go to foreign lands with the gospel. Doesn't that make sense? George Mueller was a missionary from Germany to England. He had a great amount of faith and he did such great things for the Lord. Hudson Taylor, he left England. George Mueller went to England. Hudson Taylor left England. He went to China. Great, great faith. And saw so many people saved and so many churches started. Adoniram Judson, another great missionary, full of faith. Roman Dejean. Don't you think she has faith to go back to a country that at one time she said, I'll never come back here. Never. And yet God's blessed her with faith to be able to, how, how can she do it? By faith. That's how. And it comes so natural and easy to her. Because I think she's got the gift of faith. How do you know if you have the gift of faith? You will enjoy living by faith. You'll enjoy doing it. Romans uh, 1.17 The just shall live by faith. For some Christians, that's a struggle. For other Christians, it's a joy. If you have the gift of faith, you'll be somehow trying to attempt to do some great things for God. You may not always succeed, but you'll be attempting to do it because it's a joy to you to do it. Hebrews chapter 11 will probably be one of your more favorite passages in the Scripture when it says, By faith Abel, and by faith Enoch, and by faith Noah, and by faith Abraham, and by faith Isaac, and by faith Jacob, and by faith Moses, and so on. And you'll gobble that up every time you open the pages. And of course, in times of trouble, you will instinctively rely upon the power and wisdom of God to see you through. Because you've been given this big chunk of faith. Something else though. Godly people in the church will recognize in you the gift of faith. They'll, they'll see you. They'll be able to pick you out. And they'll know if you have this gift of faith. Now, with spiritual gifts come the desire to use them. We know that. But something else it comes also the responsibility to use them for the Lord. Every one of you, if you're saved, you have a spiritual gift. And there's something you have that gives you some joy when you think about it or when you use it. Now, maybe we haven't come to your gift yet. There's still a few more. We've only covered four, and there's 11 of them we'll be looking at. But you're going to have some area of joy. There's a desire in you. That's going to be one of your first indications that maybe you've got this gift. But you also have the responsibility of figuring out what gifts you got and using them for the Lord. That's very important. Now, just because you don't have the gift of faith doesn't mean you don't have to live by faith. Why, that's silly. Just because you don't have certain other spiritual gifts, maybe you've got three out of eleven, and you're thinking, well, okay, I got three, I don't have eight. I'm only responsible for three. I don't have to worry about the eight. No, hold on, put the brakes on. All of us are supposed to learn all of these 11 areas. Because you put those 11 areas together and it gives you a picture of Jesus. When you look at all of the different 11 permanent gifts, what you're looking at is Jesus. And you're called upon to become more and more like Jesus. Just because you don't have the gift of faith doesn't mean you're not supposed to increase your faith. 
You're supposed to increase your faith. Just because you don't have the gift of ministry doesn't mean you're, you're not supposed to get involved, roll up your sleeves and help out somehow. No, you're supposed to do it. You have the responsibility to look at someone who has the gift you don't, and you have to use them as your teacher. Okay, here's a man or a woman, Christian man or woman, and they have a gift I don't have. Well, how do they do that? And I want to kind of talk to them a little bit and get to know them a little bit. I want to find out how they do that. There was a time when you didn't know how to drive a car. Others could drive a car, but you didn't know how to drive a car. You decided, I want to learn how to drive a car. So you started talking to people, reading the books, sitting behind the wheel, and then when no one's looking, make that noise with your lips. Of course, when no one's around, right? But eventually, you learn how to drive a car. Now you can drive a car. There are things that can be learned. Why? Because we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to help us to learn them. Don't you think it's better if you're going to serve the Lord? Don't you think it's better to have 11 gifts rather than one? Doesn't that make sense? You can do so much more for the Lord with 11 than you can with one. And you may only have been given one actual gift, but you've been given the responsibility to learn the other 10. But chances are you've got two or three. Maybe you've got four. Okay? Or maybe more. But you have a responsibility to learn these other ones. Now ministry is something every Christian can do. I encourage you, get busy with the talents you have. The skill set that God's given you. Get busy and start serving the Lord with these things. Did you know that befriending people befriending lost people and encouraging them to trust Jesus. Did you know that's a ministry? That's actually a ministry? And you've been given that ministry? Listen, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.18, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, listen, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of of reconciliation. That's soul winning. Every Christian is given the ministry of reconciliation. You say, but I, I am not an evangelist. I don't have the gift of the gab. Hey, a lot of us don't. But all of us have the Great Commission laid upon our shoulders. And we all need to be involved somehow with trying to win souls. Well, how do I do it? You come to Soul Winners Academy. The church teaches you how to let your light shine, what to say, what not to say, what to look for, what to offer. See, the te church will teach you all of that at Soul Winners Academy. Uh, all right, that was the first gift was ministry. The second gift was faith. And of course, faith is something that every Christian has. You cannot get saved without faith. You have faith. Luke chapter 17, 5, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Every day you should be looking for your faith to be increased. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith will grow. Just like going to the gym and doing your exercises, your muscles will grow. Your faith will grow. Every day as you get busy reading your Bible, getting, in, getting your heart and soul into God's Word, your faith will grow. But remember, once again, that all spiritual gifts display for us a different aspect of our Lord Jesus Christ. You take all 11, you put them together, and you're looking at a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus. Romans chapter 8 reminds us that all of us have the, the responsibility, the will of God is for us all to become more like Jesus. So use your spiritual gift to help you. Find out what your spiritual gift is. We've covered four of them now. If you missed Pastor Teacher, you can go online and check it out. Uh, guys, when will this one go up on the internet? Tonight? Tomorrow? Tomorrow? Okay. Tomorrow, then this one goes up on the internet. So you can always go back and review it. And then, God willing, next Wednesday, we'll take a look at another two. You see? Over a few Wednesdays, we're going to look at them all. Isn't that great? All right, let's pray. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.